Dear students, we have a task ahead of us, and that is to try to get our arms around this industry that is known as the mutual fund industry, the investment company industry. And it's not easy. As we said, there's over 12,000 funds out there. And there are dozens of different types of funds. So we're going to concentrate on the most um, important classes, the most important uh, categories, and then realizing that there are subcategories and sub 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 categories and sub 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 categories. What I want you to do is print out the mutual fund scramble sheet. Because what we would do in the face to face class is build this on the board from one end of the room to the other. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to do this for online? So I made, I printed it. I just printed it with my hands. And then I just figured out, well, let's use this in the face to face class too. So have it at your disposal because Again, we want you to know these. You, you, you're going to be the expert, the guru, the, the, uh, the, uh, the go-to person for your friends, family, and coworkers. So you really need to know these. We're going to start from the most aggressive mutual funds and then work to the least aggressive. So we're starting on slide 41 with aggressive growth funds. And that's exactly what they are. They're aggressive. They want to make eye-popping returns quickly, capital gains. And I'm not sure that this helps or not, but if it does, great. If it doesn't, ignore it. I like to think of it like a buffet, a buffet. <laughs> uh, when you go to the buffet, do you load up your plate with jalapeno peppers? or the spiciest food on the menu? No, some people will, but most people won't. You take a little bit, if any, of these aggressive growth funds. In fact, there are one or two categories above this category, sometimes called ultra, or what's the other one? Uh, pro something or other. And so if you see na names that sort of show aggression uh, realize that yeah you can make a lot of money and you can you lose a lot of money quickly exactly and if that's your strategy great but realize going in that your ten thousand dollars could quickly become seven or six or four thousand right the next category are is the category of growth funds and these are mutual funds whose primary goal are capital gains and long-term growth through typically investing in high-growth companies. And so in the prospectus, it'll say we intend to be 80% invested in growth companies. And again, we're going to dance around these topics of growth and value until we get to them in more detail in Chapter 5 on stocks. But still, that's the idea. We want companies that are growing. Um, oh yeah, mo mo momentum funds, right? They usually, usually they often will use the term momentum or pro shares or something. One example was the fund, I'm not sure if it's still around, called Janus 20. What a silly name. Now Janus is a mutual fund company. They've since merged with Henderson Funds. I think now it's called Janus Henderson, okay? But they, have a fund, they had a fund called the tw Janus 20. Oh, why did they call it Janus 20? If you remember, we must have at least 20 different investments in our portfolio if we're a mutual fund manager. Remember that? Exactly. So that's why they called it Janus 20. It was highly concentrated. It had more than 20 stocks. I think during the, the heyday in the late 90s, it had 27 or so stocks. So it's a, it's a two-edged sword. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. <laughs> and it did great while stocks were zooming up and they had the most aggressive companies. And then it did very poorly when the market went down. So what do you think of these strategies? Well, again, think of the buffet. You put a little bit, 10 20%, maybe more depending on you, how old you are, your risk tolerance in the growth and aggressive growth funds. Now it's going to get 
a little weird. Slide 42. Capital appreciation funds. Wait a minute. We, these are mutual funds that seek long-term growth of capital. So how does that differ from a growth fund? Well, as we said, most growth funds will have a provision in the prospectus that says they will uh, invest primarily in companies that are growing. But a capital appreciation fund is more flexible. It can invest in anything or, or anywhere they like. Uh, they, they, they can invest in growth stocks. They can invest in out-of-favor stocks or, or turnarounds, as they're sometimes called. They can invest in value stocks or, or income-oriented, defensive, cyclical. What are we They Relax. We're going to discuss all these categories in detail in the next chapter when we get to stocks. But still, they tend to be as risky and sometimes more risky than, than growth and aggressive growth funds. But you have to do your homework because some capital appreciation funds actually do better when the market goes down than their growth and aggressive growth counterparts because they chose you know places that they saw the opportunity for growth and they thought, well, you know, growth stocks are right now too expensive. I like these. The very uh, famous Fidelity Magellan Fund, we'll come back to that one later in the next presentation, is a capital appreciation fund. And it turns out the gentleman who ran the fund from 1977 to 1989 just was great at sniffing out potential capital appreciation. So this is what you're up against. One of the largest capital appreciation funds available to you is called the Growth Fund of America. And if you went, <laughs> if you went to the Growth Fund of America and said, hey, how come you named your fund Growth Fund of America when you're really a capital appreciation fund? They would turn around and say, look, we called ourselves the Growth Fund of America before these categories even existed. There was no category called capital appreciation fund yet. And so they'll say, you know, we were here before you, but that's what you're up against. So you really need to read everything that you can about your fund, find out everything you can about your fund to make sure you understand the strategies, the risk and the return, the risk and the return profile. So that's why on the scramble sheet, you'll see that I've written capital appreciation around aggressive growth and growth. I don't know if it makes any sense, but that's the idea. It's it's associated with and lumped together, but they're different strategies in different types of funds. Slide 43. Now we're talking growth and income. Remember we said what we get from our investments are capital appreciation, growth, and income, cash flows, in the case of stocks, that refers to dividends, which we'll get into in more detail in the next chapter. But these are funds that invest to seek both long-term growth and current income with usually the emphasis on capital gains. They sometimes will own bonds to augment the income, and you'll see them sometimes called uh, blend or sometimes value stocks, but be careful, value funds, but be careful that that's a loaded term that we're going to take a look at in a moment. So growth and in income is my uh, um, personal favorite, especially for younger folks starting off and even you know folks in their 40s and the like. Once you get into your 50s and 60s, you're going to want to keep your growth and income funds, but you're going to want to start adding more uh, conservative funds. So if the Growth and the aggressive growth and the uh, capital appreciation were the spice, the really spicy foods. What's the growth and income fund? Well, that's the meat and potatoes. That's the uh, the pasta. That's the main entree that you put 40, 50 or more percent into your portfolio. Sometimes for younger folks, that's all they really need to start off with. Make sense? I hope so. Growth and income, my personal favorite. Now, along with growth and income funds, funds are sometimes lumped together these value funds. But again, it's a, it's a subtle difference. Value funds, and, and you go, again, you have to read about your 
mutual fund to be sure exactly you understand what their strategy is. They will seek stocks that are undervalued in the market by investing in shares that have low PE multiples. What? And that high dividend yield? Relax. That's, that's the problem with teaching mutual funds before stocks and bonds. There's, there's an advantage to doing stocks before bond, mutual funds, but there's an also advantage of doing mutual funds before stocks and bonds, and that's why we're doing them. We, we want you to learn about mutual funds because that's more important for the vast majority of people. So they look for companies that are out of favor. So you'll hear the term, we are value investors. We like fund, we like mutual, we like stocks. I'm sorry, we're a mutual fund that likes stocks where they are cheaper vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, their other uh, types of companies out in the industry. Okay, so that they're lumped together with growth and income, but they're not always the same. And uh, that's still part of the brew, the uh, pasta, the uh, the main dish. The next category in the stock world is called equity income. Now, if they had asked me, I would have said call it stock dividend funds because equities mean stocks and income from stocks is dividends. But that's they didn't ask me. <laughs> so people are supposed to understand that equity income means a mutual fund that invests primarily in high yielding income producing common stocks. Now they can own bonds also, you know, to generate income. But what kind of companies are we talking about? Railroads, food companies, utilities, real estate investment trusts, banks and the like. They're not real sexy, you know, they're not growing like Farce Book and Titter and those other companies, but they ain't going anywhere. <laughs> People's got to eat, right? Food. And uh, you don't want to take cold showers in the dark, so you need your utility. So these are the boring companies. Now, where is this in our, in our analogy of, the, uh, of the, uh, the buffet? Oatmeal. Yeah, you know, boring old oatmeal, but is oatmeal good for you? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> it's a whole lot better for you than steak and eggs or bacon. You know? and yeah, I know some people like oatmeal, but look what it does for horses. You know, think about horses. I mean, they're beautiful, huge animals, and they like oats. So these are more important to people who are really worried about the stock market bouncing downward. And they become very important, in my humble opinion, once you're in your 1950s, in your 50s, 60s, elderly. Once you hit, well, I shouldn't use it, mature. I'm sorry, I'm there, so what am I saying? Uh, once you, you're, you're, you, you can't really uh, stomach those 50% drops that we see in the market. And what we see with an equity income fund is stock, the stock market might fall 50% as a whole, right? Uh, the aggressive growth funds... The growth funds will fall 60, 70 percent or more, some of them, whereas the equity income funds, they'll drop 30 percent or a little bit, you know, plus or minus. That's what happened in, um, in 2008. And, you know, it sounds doesn't sound like a big deal, but it is. Your $10,000 becomes $3,000 if you lose 70 percent. If you lose 50 percent, it becomes 5,000. If you lose 30 percent, it's 7,000. You see the difference? The numbers going down are far more uh, <laughs> scary and uh, disturbing than when you're going back up again. And if you lose 50%, you got to get 100% to get back to where you were. If you lose 70%, you got to get over 300% to get back to where you were. So that's why equity income funds are a great choice for people who are very frightened of the market or in their later years of their um, investing career. And let's read together. Many equity income funds did very well during 2000 to 2002 bear market after lagging the market badly during the late 1990s bull market because these companies were, and you might have heard the term, old economy. And everybody wanted new economy. Everybody wanted the, the telecom and the internet stocks and them. And, and they, many of them just completely busted and died, whereas railroads were still chugging along, exactly. Did that save them in 2008? Well, as we said, they lost a whole lot less than their growth counterparts. But still, 
they um, they went down as opposed to many of them went up during the the 2000 to 2002 bear market, which was uh, not what you would expect. Well, that's when people realized, hey, yeah, my utility ain't going anywhere. Whereas DrCoop.com, which most of you have never even heard of, or AOL, you ever remember those? AOL, America Online, yeah. Okay, slide forty-five. Okay, so now you got that right. You got that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to overlay other categories on top of those categories. Are you with me? So we're. <laughs> I told you it's going to get a little hairy. We're going to now look at a category called domesticity, which we mentioned back in chapter one. I'm sorry. No, domesticity is down here. First, we're going to take a look at the size of the company, what's called the capitalization. And we'll, we'll learn how to do capitalization in Chapter 5. So that's why you see large cap, mid cap, small cap. Nothing to do with you know, sombreros or hats or anything like that. It's the how big the company is. And so large companies, medium-sized companies, and small companies. So where are we, huh? Who is the riskiest in the, uh, in, the, in the capitalization world? Well, indeed, the small companies are the riskiest. Why? Because they certainly don't have the, the wherewithal to withstand when we have a, a huge recession or something like that. They just don't have the roots that deep in the economy, unlike the large companies, which do, which are better suited, better, uh, better uh, able to withstand those those storms that come in our economy. Of course, when the when the economy does better, who does better? Right, the small company stocks. They're more nimble. They've been knocked down farther, and they're able to better um, um, uh, move themselves into the into the uh, the new opportunities. And of course, me medium size are, are in between. And then the domesticity. Well, we've already talked about this in chapter one. Where are you based? Inside the United States? Outside the United States or globally? Are you a global company? Are you a, gl a global mutual fund that can invest in companies no matter where that company is? So it used to be that domestic mutual funds were considered less risky than their foreign or international overseas counterparts, and global was somewhere in the middle. But it's just not it's just not true anymore. It's just not true. Some companies outside the United States do a large percentage of their business inside the United States. Many companies inside the United States do a large percentage of their business outside the United States. So it's all jumbled up. And then there's even one company, I think I've mentioned them, that is based in the United States but doesn't do any business in the United States. <laughs> That's Philip Morris International. They're the people who sell the, uh, the Siggies. Marlboro and Virginia Jim Dims outside the United States, although they're based, you know, they're based here. So that's all jumbled up. So what you see in the mutual fund scramble sheet is that mutual fund companies started to mix and match. Pick one from column A and one from column B and one from column C. So, oh my goodness, it's a domestic large cap growth and income fund, or it's a global small cap aggressive growth fund. And now can you see how we've wound up with over 12,000 funds? Because if one company had a domestic large cap growth and income fund, all of the companies had to have a domestic large cap equity income fund. And they, they, just, they just exploded the number of offerings in the 1980s and 90s. Yeah, that's how it worked. And then there are other categories, regional funds, funds that just invest in the Far East or Japan or Latin America. There's one fund that just invests in California. And at first you think, well, that's dumb. <laughs> I mean, you know, California is just one state. If California were its own country, it'd be the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. So there's plenty to, uh, to, to choose from. Plus, they happen to be the companies that are lumped in with the, the disruptors of the world, the Googlays, the, uh, the farce books, fib books, whatever it's called. Uh, and so and so that's you know that's that's if you want high tech you know here you go invest in california um but do you remember what the two main reasons why we bought a mutual fund right we bought mutual funds for uh, um diversification and professional money management 
Am I diversifying by just buying China or or Japan or the emerging markets? It's, no, I'm concentrating. That's why personally I'm a big fan of global funds. Personally, with a, you know, you you depends. People are sometimes a little worried. Let's do stick with domestic. And some people like uh, Mr. Uh, Bod Bogle, John Bogle, uh, who was the primary person behind Vanguard. He says, look, just stick with the United States companies. Many of these companies, especially our larger companies, do a large percent of their, their business outside the United States. So you're basically uh, getting overseas you know, international exposure. I disagree with him. I mean, I want my mutual fund manager to be able to go find the best company no matter where it is based. Quick, which is the lar world's largest tire manufacturer? Hmm? I think some of you could probably name it. Yeah, it's Michelin. It's based in France, right? And who, who's the, the largest food company? It's Nestle. It's based in Switzerland, right? Who's the one of the largest cement companies? Cemex, Cementos de Mexico. It's based in Monterrey. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you, this is why it costs a lot of money to run a well-run mutual fund. You've got to go around the world and find the best companies no matter where they are. So I'm not a big fan of that. And I'm definitely not a big fan of these sector funds. Uh, sector funds are mutual funds that invest just in one sector of the economy. Energy, technology, healthcare, wireless, uh, leisure, uh, whatever, you name it, apparel. Uh, dumb. I don't like it. Why? Because, again, we want diversification. Now, let's say you work in the healthcare field, you work in the energy field, and you say, you know what? Things are really hopping and popping. I'm going to invest in uh, in a in a sector fund in my industry, fine. But again, a little bit on your plate, 10, 20 percent. Don't fill up your whole plate with this because one sector can just get clobbered, folks. It just happens. Now, healthcare people say, well, Piano, come on, healthcare. Yeah, right. Healthcare is 20 percent of our economy. So so mm -hmm. there are there are some ex 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 uh, exceptions to that. But again, I like diversification. And if anybody tries to sell you or talk you into a market timing fund, these are people who say they can divine <laughs> what's going to happen in the next three, six, nine months, time the market. They can't do it. Bernard Baruch, one of the most famous investors in the early to mid 20th century, said, don't try to time the market. It can only be done by liars. It's kind of like the fish that got away yeah okay uh it's for slide 46 so you see what you're up against okay make sure you understand that this is a huge conglomeration of mix and max and permutations but that's 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 what the industry is made up of so now, now let's take a look at bond funds again stocks are riskier than bonds stocks are going to over the long term unless the world ends give us a better return than bonds but bonds have their place, especially with people who are terrified of, <laughs> of uh, the stock market. Or as we get older, bonds become an important part of our portfolio mix, our asset allocation, which we'll come back to in detail later on. Remember, we call bonds fixed income or just fixed investments because we know what we're going to get. These are mutual funds that invest in various kinds and grades of bonds with income as the primary objective normally. But again, we're going to go from the riskiest to the least riskiest. And here, the riskiest bond funds are called high yield or high income funds. What's the real name for them? Junk, junk bond funds. And we'll discuss junk bonds when we get to bonds in more detail. But the danger with these things is that they are often more correlated with stocks than bonds. What does that mean? It means they tend to follow the stock market more than they follow the bond market. Why? Because they're made up of bonds from companies that are either in trouble or have have really loaded up tons of debt. And just like just as a person with a bad credit score, these corporations have bad credit scores. So they have to pay more to borrow money, which is great as long as they can make the payments. But if there's a recession, what happens? Right. Earnings fall. Some of these companies go bankrupt. Others have to just basically say, look, you know, we can't make our payments this month. You just have to wait. And so 
those bond funds are going to get hammered when the, the same time that stock funds get hammered. And that's typically not what we want if we're buying bond funds. We want protection from the vagaries of the, bond, of the stock market. So we, we um, might put a little bit of this on our plate if we're you know, a bond investor, but, uh, but be careful because they're, they're, they're spicy. Not as bad as the aggressive growth funds. But still, you know, let's say the 2008, let's, for example, um, the aggressive growth funds lost 60, 70 percent. The high yield bond funds lost 30 percent, which was much more than what other bond funds lost. And that's um, that's that's an enormous amount for a bond fund. When bond funds lose money, it's usually five, 10 percent at the most. But 2008 was a very difficult year for everybody. Now. The corporate bond funds tend to be middle of the road. Be careful, you'll now see core and core plus in Morningstar's ratings. Core plus means that they've you know, done their best to raise what they're paying at the expense, expense of safety. So that, that was Morningstar's way of tr gently, because people don't understand, wouldn't core plus be more than just core? And that's not, no, it's... They should say core minus because <laughs> they're trying to gently tell people, hey, look, the next recession, these funds are going to get hurt. They don't categorize them as high yield bond funds, uh, as junk bond funds, but they're just saying, you know, be careful. And that's a truism now because debt, the world is awash of debt. And uh, you'll hear people say, oh, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. You know, eventually the world does end. You know, eventually the sun gets bigger and bigger and bigger until we're all fried. But it's not for another billion years, so relax. And eventually our economy is going to have another 2008, another 2000 to 2002, 1973, 1974. It's going, it's going to happen. We, we know it's going to happen, but you just don't know when and how bad. So you want a core corporate bond fund for those of you who are interested in income from companies that do pay their debts. Now, it turns out that some people are really into municipal bonds, and these tend to be high net worth, high income people. Why is that? Well, as we mentioned quickly, and we're going to go in detail when we get to bonds, muni bonds, municipal bonds from state and local governments, are free from federal income taxes. That's part of the Constitution. The feds can't tax the states. The states can't tax the feds. So if you buy a muni bond fund, you won't pay federal taxes on your income. Very cool. Then if you buy a state-specific muni bond fund, such as one from California, for those of us who live in California, you will not only pay no income taxes on the interest to the feds, to the IRS, you also will not pay any income to the state of California. The state of California is basically saying, hey, buy bonds from us. Now, it doesn't matter where, school district, uh, uh, bridge authority, uh, city, county, whatever. Buy from somewhere based in California and we won't charge you any tax. And it's true of other states too, right? Other states that charge income taxes will will give you a break if you buy their bonds. Cool, cool. And so they don't pay as well as the corporate bond funds, but you don't pay as much taxes. So the after-tax yield, which we'll learn how to compute when we get the bonds, may be higher with the bonds, with the muni bonds fund. Very cool, right? Yes, very cool. And they're, they're less risky than corporate bonds. Yeah, because corporations go bankrupt every now and then. Municipalities, it's very rare that they go bankrupt. There were a few that went bankrupt after the 2008 uh, Great Recession, but very few, not as many as some people said there were going to be. And then <clears throat> that, so that's the, the, I'm sorry, that's the highest risk, the high yield bonds, down to the municipal bonds until we get to U.S. backed bonds on slide 47 or government bonds themselves. Now, U.S. backed bonds are not the same as Treasury bonds. You might have heard of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Fannie Mae is not a candy company, folks. It's a company that that is very involved in the mortgage market for creating what we often use the term liquidity money for people to lend to would-be 
buyers of homes or, or people refinancing and the like. And for many years, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were private entities that were sponsored originally by the Congress, by the United States Congress. And there was an implicit guarantee, even though the Congress people and senators would say, no, 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 Fannie and Freddie are, 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 are private companies. You could invest in them. You could buy stock in them. And they did very well for many years. And we're not going to backstop them if they get into trouble. Ooh, along in the 2008 recession, which was caused by the mortgages that were basically liar loans. Sign here. Are you alive? Can you fog a mirror? You're breathing? Very good. You get a $500,000 loan, even though you can't afford one. And they got caught up with it along with everybody else. And along to the rescue comes the United States government. So, dear students, you and I are proud owners of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And there's been much gnashing and weeping of, I'm sorry, weeping and gnashing of teeth about how, beating of breath, how we're going to extricate ourselves from ownership in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But in the meantime, they have been paying the treasury billions of dollars every quarter because they're very profitable. So ooh, how do we do this? It's, it's, it's a bit of a conundrum. Uh, uh, everybody has their own idea, but of course they can't play nice in the sandbox these days. And then of course the granddaddy of them all, where's my pointer here? The treasury market. Government securities funds, treasury bond funds, they are the safest. I don't care what anybody says. The United States government will pay its debts. So, <laughs> you know, if, if the world ends, then it doesn't matter where your money is. But the um, United States government ain't going anywhere anytime soon, let's hope. Um, it's interesting. Remember we said that the feds can't tax the, the states and the states can't tax the feds. So your treasury bond income, treasury bill income, is free from from state taxes and then again we're going to do the exact same thing as we did before with stocks we're going to overlay on top of it two more categories well remember domestic oops where's my point ah I'm gonna figure this out one of these days there's my pointer global and international bonds right so the idea is domestic is safer than international global somewhere in between and then this guy the maturity Hmm, LS and intermediate is kind of like mid. No, it has nothing to do with large cap, mid cap, small cap, the, the size of the company. This is when do the bonds mature? And it's a little counterintuitive. You might think that long-term bonds are safer than short-term bonds. No, it's the exact opposite. Short-term bonds are less risky than long-term bonds. And when you think about it for a moment, it makes perfect sense. Oh, I understand. Right, if your money's out there for 15, 20, 30 years, there's more opportunity for things to go wrong than if your money is out there for two or three or four years, like a short-term bond. In fact, short-term bonds start to, short-term bond funds start to look like money markets, which are due in six months, nine months, you see? So the shorter your money is out there, the less risk and the less return. Of course, long-term bonds are going to pay more than short-term bonds. And that is typical of the industry. But as we're going to see, there's an opportunity for capital gains that is higher with long-term bonds than short-term bonds. What? Capital gain in a bond? It's a, it's a loan. How does the loan change in value? Ah, dear students. Stick with us because it is. It's one of the trickiest parts about bonds is that the trickiest parts about bonds is that they don't they're not fixed. <laughs> the price go the interest rate is fixed. Yeah, those bond the interest rate doesn't change on the bonds, but the price can go up and down. And that's that tends to you know disconcert people. So we'll come back to that later. So you got it? Again. We're going to pick one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. So it's a domestic, long-term government securities bonds or whatever it is. And there's dozens and dozens of different permutations. <sighs> so that was bonds. Now, here's something a little different on slide 48. Balance funds. Hmm. We 
made a quick mention of these back in chapter one. This is a mutual fund that whose objective is to generate a balanced return of current income and long-term capital gains by investing in both stocks and bonds. Very cool. That's why it's called balance. And these have been around for decades. Typically, we would see the asset allocation to be about 60% stocks, 40% bonds, but you know, it changes as the investment environment changes. One of my favorite balanced funds is the American Balanced Fund. It's been around in one form or another since 1937. <laughs> and it states that the fund is managed as the complete U.S. investment program of a prudent investor. Don't you just, I love that word, prudent. And we're going to take some risks, but we're not going to, you know, roll the dice. And here's how they run this fund. They never allow themselves to be more than 75% stocks, 25% bonds, or less than 50% stocks, 50% bonds. And there's a reason for that that we'll come back to later. But it turns out that they can say, you know what, stocks are a really good deal now, the market's crashed, let's up our amount of stocks to 20 to 75% and reduce our bond exposure to 25, I'm sorry, I said it right? Up our stock exposure to 75% and reduce our bond exposure to 25%. Or they might say, hmm, stocks are pretty high. Let's have 50% stocks, 50% bonds. But they're not going to try to time the market. They're not going to try to time the market. They're not going to do what's called um, strategic asset allocation, which we'll see on the next slide. But you might say, Frank, didn't you tell me we're going to go from the most riskiest to the least riskiest? Shouldn't balance funds be somewhere in between stocks and bonds? Ha, 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 ha. That is the cool thing of what, what happens when you add stocks and bonds together. You wind up with something that's a little bit less risky than either of them put together. And why is that? Well, it doesn't always work this way. But typically, when stocks are doing well, bonds are not. And vice versa. They tend to be negatively correlated with one another. And we'll come back to that term later on. If you remember it, fine. If you don't remember it, don't worry about it. We'll come back to it later on. So, so if you have a balance, you tend to smooth out those, those hills and valleys. And I'm a big fan of balance funds for retired folks, especially those who are you know comfortable with the market downturns and are not going to throw everything out the window when, when, when the market goes down because balance funds tend to do better when the market falls than their stock counterparts. Not necessarily as well as the bond funds, but they're going to do a whole lot better than the bond funds as the stock funds are doing well. So I'm a big fan, my personally, of balance funds. And especially for people, even if they're younger, if they're just plain and simple terrified. <laughs> the balance funds are, a well-run balance fund is a great um, uh, choice for those people. Slide 49, asset allocation funds. Now be careful these tend to be lumped in with balance funds, but they are anything but balance funds. They are mutual funds that spread investors' money across stocks, bonds, and money market securities. Although they're, they're, they're lumped in with balance funds, the investment advisor often more diligently tries to fine-tune the allocation as market conditions change. In other words, they are timing the market. And folks, what did we say about timing the market? It just cannot be done. Whereas the balance fund usually stays around 60, 40%. The asset allocation fund might say, you know what? The market's going to crash. Stocks and bonds, let's put everything into cash. Or let's move everything into stocks. And that's just dangerous. I mean, you might get it right. Congratulations if you do. But for me, that ain't prudent and i'm certainly not going to recommend it to clients i ain't going to buy it but you might decide you know these these uh, you might see names like strategic allocation fund or tactical allocation fund read the prospectus read whatever you can talk to your advisor if you're using one talk to the mutual fund company but in my humble opinion it ain't worth the risk eh i'd rather have the balance fund the boring old balance fund <sighs> Finally, we've come to the very last category of our mutual funds, 
and that's money market mutual funds. Because money market mutual funds, as we discussed back in chapter one, are short-term investments. These people are putting your money into commercial paper, treasury bills. Some of them only do treasury bills. Some do very short-term municipal securities, and that makes them tax-exempt. They are essentially as safe as the guaranteed money market accounts that you get at a bank or a credit union. But what's the difference? Right, they are not guaranteed. I think we mentioned that. We'll mention it again. They are not guaranteed, and it'll say it on all the literature that you get, and people will say, oh, yeah, my money market's guaranteed. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you really are interested in this, and it is an interesting uh, in my, you know, of course, me, you know, I'm not biased, but just type in breaking the buck into any search engine um, and you will find a wealth of articles and and the like commentaries about this, because that's exactly what happens. They lose a penny. They go from a dollar down to 99 cents and it happens very infrequently. And when it does, the whole world takes notice. Last time it happened, you got it, <laughs> was the uh, 2008 when Lehman Brothers was allowed to go under and a two mutual, money market mutual funds that were holding a lot of paper, commercial paper from Lehman Brothers, then went, oops, <laughs> uh, one went to 99 cents, the other one I think went to 97 cents. And that's when the organic matter hit the ventilating device, September 2008. That's when people started realizing how serious this was. So there's some three trillion or four trillion dollars in money market mutual funds. Can you imagine if everybody said, I want my money now? A run on the banks. It's like a run on the banks, it's a run on the money markets. So the Federal Reserve Bank. Sorry, that was out of tune. They come running to the rescue and say, Don't worry, folks, we will backstop. We're the Federal Reserve Bank. We've got more money than God. And we will pay off any uh, problems with these money markets. And typically what happens is the company goes to the regulators and says, look, you know, we screwed up. Can we take money out of our pockets and put it in the pockets of our investors? Usually that's never allowed. You never commingle your money with your investors. But the regulators say, yeah, I think it's a good idea, you goofball. And so, <laughs> and so that's exactly what happened here. The Federal Reserve Bank came to the rescue and said, don't worry, um, for the next six months, we will backstop any money market mutual fund. And then that was, you know, September 2, whatever, you know, in March. And then they did the same thing in March. They said for the next six months, this was, you know, this was the, the, the depth of the Great Recession. We will backstop the, uh, the money market mutual funds. And by that time, things had calmed down to some point where they didn't have to do it anymore. And before that, I think you have to go back 20 years or 25 years before you see the uh, a previous breaking the buck. So it's just very, very rare. But check it out because it's a pretty interesting um, uh, uh, thing to study for you, you investment gurus. Okay, <laughs> okay. Slide 51. Mutual funds of mutual funds. What? Well, you knew it had to happen, right? <laughs> no, these things are very popular now. And why is that? Because of employer-sponsored plans such as 401ks, 403bs. You, sometimes they're called lifestyle funds or target date funds or target risk funds. You start working for a company and you say, you know what, I'm not gonna retire until 2050 or 2060. And there's a fund called the Lifestyle Retirement 2050 Fund. And that's the fund you choose. And if you don't, many companies now, because of what the Congress has done, they will automatically put you into that fund. They will take 3% or whatever out of your paycheck, 5%, and they will automatically put the, put you in that fund based on, because they have your they have your birth uh, date, they know when you're born, they know your age, so they say, yeah, you're probably gonna retire in 2060 or whatever. And if they do that, then you can't sue them for giving you a bad recommendation. The Congress has given them a safe harbor so these things have become very, very popular. And what do they do? They typically just turn around, take the money, and put it into mutual funds that that company runs. If it's Fidelity, then they're Fidelity funds. If it's Vanguard, then they're Vanguard funds. And then as the time horizon shortens, 
they change the mix of the mutual funds, doing exactly what we did. They start sliding down the risk versus return. If you're younger, you have more stocks. If you're older, you have more bonds. I find that they're too conservative for my tastes, but that's me. And I know what I'm doing, and I, I guess I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, right? And I recommend to people, you know, they're too conservative. You don't have to be that conservative. You can choose these funds. If they come and ask me, I think this is going to be better for you. But if not, you know, then the world doesn't end. They should do okay because they're matching the time horizon to when you believe you're going to need the money for retirement or for college or, or whatever. So pretty cool. These things are very popular. And you're going to study them when you study, the, when you do one of your assignments, the lifestyle funds they're called in the thrift savings plan for the federal government which is a very good 401k plan, by the way. Slide 52, specialty funds. Stay away, stay away, stay away, folks. These things, eh, you might do well, but these boutique exotic funds, just no. First of all, hedge funds are not mutual funds. They, they are lumped in with mutual funds, and they work like a mutual fund, but they're totally different. They have... They, they could put all the money on one company if they wanted to. They charge outrageous fees. They become rock stars and celebrities, and some of them do well. But it used to be you had to have at least $200,000 in, uh, in income, and, uh, and you had to have a million dollars in assets. But now with ten grand, you can get into one of these hedge funds. Stay away. They, out, they charge outrageous uh, pro, uh, fees much higher than we've seen. But hey, you know, you might decide Piano doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to go with this guy. Bear funds try to make money when the market goes down, which is very difficult because the market goes up more than it goes down. But if you're worried that the market's going to fall, buy a bear fund, and then the market goes up even more, and the market goes up even more, then you lose more and more and more because you lose if the market goes up. And then finally, you give in. You say, okay, I'll sell my bear fund. Then the market tanks 30%. That's how it works. We'll see that you can invest in gold and other precious metals and hard assets through mutual funds. Well, we'll have enough to say about gold later on. And then you can buy REIT funds, real estate investment trust funds. It's a way to get involved in real estate. But the problem with REIT funds is there's just not that many REITs out there. So you, you're basically very, very concentrated. But it's a way to get involved in real estate without buying a property. And then there are just dozens and dozens of these funds, like the Stock Car Stocks Fund. What, what do they invest in? Y you know, I have a hard time believing this, but the most popular spectator sport in the United States is not football or baseball or basketball. It's NASCAR. <laughs> Every Sunday... Down in Louisiana or Alabama or in Kentucky, 200,000 people gather at the track and watch people go around the track at 200 miles an hour. Okay. And what do they have on all the cars and all the hats and all the, on the jerseys? Advertising. And if Folgers is the official coffee of the NASCAR, then that's what those people bought. So this fund invests in the companies that are promoted by NASCAR. Okay, fine. Pause, Tombstone Fund. Now, Pause was the name of the company. Tombstone was the name of the fund. What do you think they invest in? Right, cemetery, <laughs> mortuaries, people, companies that make uh, caskets and the like. Because everybody's got to die. And thankfully, so did the Pause Tombstone Fund. And then I cannot, you cannot make this up. There was the Chicken Little Growth Fund, folks, for people who worried that the sky was falling. You don't believe me. Look it up. <laughs> Look it up. There was, I don't know if it's still around, the Timothy Fund, which was for good Christians because of some letter that that St. Paul wrote to Timothy about being a good steward of the, I don't know, whatever. I don't even look it up. Uh, look, this is Caesar, folks. Render under Caesar that which is Caesar. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, this is Caesar. Render under God, which is God. So if you hear somebody coming to you with, uh, you know, the, uh, the Lord is going to make you rich, like wrong. The Lord's going to make you rich, but not with this kind of riches, you know. Put your treasures in heaven. You know, you, 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 if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. So be, be careful 
when anybody is using uh, religion as their as their um, their selling point. The choices are endless, and so are the fees, dear students. So stay away from these specialty funds. Slide 53. Now, index funds. Now, we've spent much time talking about these guys, and we really do need to concentrate and understand them because they are a significant force. And as we said, the, the financial media is beating the drum saying, you can't do better than the index, so just stick with the index funds. Anybody who tells you differently is lying, so that means Piano's lying, and I'm not lying, so as you're going to see. So don't listen to me. Listen to them. I don't know. Listen to me. Don't listen to them. But at least you understand that there is this, this tug of war going on. So let's, let's, let's go back and uh, look at this carefully. Remember the term passively managed, where they don't do any research. These are mutual funds that buy and hold as portfolio of stocks or bonds equivalent to those in some specific market index. We talked about the S&P 500. Maybe you've heard of the Dow. Of course you've heard of the Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Russell 2000 for small companies. And we will look at the major indices in detail in the next chapter. But there's no active management performed. They don't go to GM knock on their doors. They don't go to Ford or Toyota or Honda and decide, yeah, we're going to buy Honda and GM. We're not going to buy Ford and Toyota. Why do we have these? Well, as we saw, they should give us very low fees. And many actively managed funds don't beat the market. Well, there's various reasons for that. We saw some people just do really poorly. And of course, you got the fees that you have to overcome. The index doesn't have fees. But because of the annual fee, an index cannot actually manage match the market's performance, but it should come very close, providing they don't sneak in the one with a high annual fee. Whereas, as we saw, an actively managed fund could substantially outperform or underperform the market index. So, the rationale for index funds came from research done in the early 1970s that statistically showed that many of the actively fund, managed funds did not beat the market. And you, they said, look, a monkey throwing darts at a dartboard would do better than some of these people. However, many actively, fund, many actively managed funds do beat their respective indices over time long periods of time is what I'm looking for. 10, 20, 40, 50 years. Look for a fund family where most all funds have consistently beaten their respective indices over decades. Now the problem is that some funds will be associated with a certain index, but it's really not a good association. I mean, the S&P 500 is the one that's most used, but you have some of these value funds that are, or, or equity income funds, that are more sensitive to uh, uh, stocks that are very risky, very high growth, high, high risk companies. And they will, by design, eschew, uh, avoid, eschew, not, not, not Gesundheit, no. They will avoid, <laughs> that means avoid. They will stay away from those, uh, those, those companies. Well, to compensate for that lower risk, What's going to happen? We know it's going to happen. They're going to have lower return. But you knew that, or you should have known that going in. So to compare one of these funds against the Standard & Poor's 500 Index, in my uh, humble opinion, is just not fair. So there are other indices that are managed by other people. And so you, they say, okay, well, compare us against this indice. Uh, I think it's better to compare the fund you're interested in against their category, their peers. And that's part of the thing you're going to see, part of what you're going to see when you do the assignment. You're going to see, okay, this is the index that they're associated with, and this is how well they did against the index. But how well did they do against their category? That's more important to me because it just isn't fair sometimes. And there are some funds that just don't match any index. You know, they have, a, they have their own strategy that, that you, you scratch your heads and what do you do with them? Look for companies that have done well over decades. And in the late 1990s, and in my humble opinion, right now, index funds became victims of their own success. Because whenever you hear people saying how 
This is the surefire way to invest. There is no other way. This You used to only go with index funds. That's when I get really nervous <laughs> because it's the conventional wisdom is just always, there's always something more to the conventional wisdom than what you hear. Just like 15 years ago, oh, real estate's the best place to be, don't worry. And 20 years ago, internet stocks, blue skies, productivity gains. Yeah, and uh, it's like a Greek tragedy. You don't know how long it's going to last, but there's going to be dead bodies somewhere along the line. Slide 55. Here are some of the indices that we will discuss in detail in our next chapter Standard & Poor's 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Dow Jones U.S. Total Stock Market Index. Why did they name it that? Who's going to remember that? It used to be called the Wilshire 5000. The NASDAQ, the, the, the World Index, the EFA. That's how it's pronounced, EFA, although it looks like EFE. Um, these, uh, these are the main ones, and we'll want you to memorize the main ones, but not until Chapter 5, so relax. And there are dozens and dozens of other index funds available now. As we said, they are now the current investments. And if you don't trust me and you think Payano doesn't know what he's talking about, and you might be right, go take a look at um, IFA.com. These are the index fund advisors. Ah, there's dozens of these people who are passing themselves off as index fund experts. So uh, of course, they're going to charge you for their services. What are the downsides to index funds? Well, First of all, as I said, when people, when everyone says everything is great and humble and this is the only way to invest, that's when it scares me. But let's take a look at a downside. So this is slide 56. And it's not going to make a whole lot of sense yet because you really don't know what P.E. is, price to earnings ratio. We'll get to that in Chapter 5. I know I apologize. It's, I keep saying we're going to get to that later. But it's the way you got to, you either got to put stocks and bonds first and then do mutual funds but mutual funds are so important that I put it before that because I know we're going to lose a lot of people. So I want to at least get you to understand mutual funds before you go out into the world and be awesome. Index funds become skewed, uh, bent toward a certain particular sector of the economy or region of the world. And the index doesn't know any better. It just knows these are the list, the companies on the list. But in the 1980s, I'm old enough to remember when Japan, not China, was going to take over the world. And the Japanese market went skyrocketing. It just went so high that people just would just look around and say, what's going on here? And at the end of the decade, Japan made up 60%, almost 59.8% of the Europe, Australia, and the Far East. And this stands for Morgan Stanley Capital International. Don't have to worry about that. That's the company that made the index. And Europe, Australia, and the Far East. That was considered the best measure of what's going on outside the United States. So we had Western Europe, uh, Canada was in there, South Africa, Australia, Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong. Who am I missing? That's it. Those are the biggies. Those were the biggies. I think a little bit of, yeah, I said South Africa. So, so these were the developed part of the uh, economies outside the United States back in the 70s and 1980s. And so Japan made up 60% of, of the uh, IFA. And you thought you were getting a broad-based index. No, you were getting 60% Japan. And what's this PE stand for? Well, just know for now that the higher the number, the more risky the investment. So Japan had a PE of 52. That's very high, where everybody else had 13. Western Europe, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong. And that's more reasonable, much more reasonable. What happened? You thought you were getting a broad-based index. No, you weren't. The next several years saw the Japanese stock market fall 80%. Or more, I think maybe, no, maybe about 80%. From 36 down to 8 or something like that. It was bad. It was bad. So you thought you were well diversified, but you're not. And then the same thing happened at the end of the 1990s. Stocks went in two directions, up and way up. And the internet stocks and the computer companies and the software companies and the media companies that were uh, being just created, like America Online, 
they exploded. So they made up in an RSS 500 largest companies in the United States fully one third of the index. Whereas everybody else, and we're talking healthcare, energy, consumer products, materials, all the other companies in the uh, S&P 500 made up two thirds. But notice again the difference. PE 59, huge price to earnings ratio, even though 19 is pretty long, pretty high, it was nowhere near as high as that. And then the tech sector, right, in the 2000 to 2002 bear market, fell 80%, a little over 80%, whereas the S&P 500 fell just shy of 50%. So you thought you were well diversified, but no, you were skewed toward the um, the um, the tech sector in the, in the late 2000s, and again we said, remember the equity income funds actually did better. Equity, the old companies, the railroad companies, the food companies. People said, you know what, these companies ain't going anywhere. I'll put my money there. And so, so you have to be careful. And what what we ask you to do as a as a bonus assignment is take a look at what what the S and P 500 is made up of now. Take a look. See what you think and uh, see if index funds are the fail safe superlative way to invest. OK, enough said. Huh. Slide 57. ET We're almost done. Relax. I know. Take a break. ETFs um, are basically, well, they started about 20 some, uh, no, not even 20 years ago. And they um, they uh, first started off as index funds. These are the open ended mutual funds that trade as a listed security on a stock exchange. They look like a closed end fund. You buy and sell them on the exchange, but they're an open end fund in that they have no limit to the number of shares. They have become, I say becoming, we should say they have become very popular because you can buy and sell them throughout the day. So some people use them as trading vehicles. Well, that's good luck for them. We're long-term investors, right? I, I want to see you nod your heads. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Most all ETFs are passively managed. They basically jumped from the index world. But there are now some that are actively managed. But the coolest thing about ETFs is their names, like spiders and diamonds and cubes. That's the best. No, <laughs> anyway, so check out ETFs. You might decide, especially if you stick with a company like Fidelity or Vanguard, that doesn't change you, charge you any commission on their ETFs. So then you put 50 bucks a month away, set it up automatically, and they'll love you and you'll love them if they do well. Slide 58, socially responsible funds. What, Piano? what are you talking? I know this has become much more popular. It's called ESG, it's Environmental, Social, and Governments, Governance. These are mutual funds that actively and directly incorporate ethics and morality into investment decisions. Well, they've been around for decades. Some of these mutual funds have been around for 50, 60, 70 years, they've refused to invest in alcohol and tobacco. And that was just the, their way of saying we're ethical. But then in the 1970s, they started moving to companies that polluted, build weapons, nuclear power plants, destroy the rainforests, forests, and then companies that exploited labor. And is it surprising that there are any companies left to invest in? <laughs> well, silliness aside, you know, many of these have done quite well for their investors. Why? Because they tend to be in the tech sector which has outperformed what we know over the last 40 years, except for the internet bubble. So uh, you might see this environmental, social governance thing, ESG, or just socially responsible. And then, <laughs> I know, it's just kind of humorous if you ask me. Slide 59, socially irresponsible funds, possibly as a backlash to socially responsible funds and their perceived political overtones. There is a mutual fund called the Vice Fund. And yes, you guessed it, it invests in the tobacco and alcohol. The manager says he simply loves cigarettes, all the other corporate nasties you can think of, gambling defense firm. And although it is still a very small fund with high fees, it's actually done pretty well. So check out the Vice Fund because... Yes, if you can sell people something that costs you a little over a penny to make and you sell 20 of them in a, in a box for $8, cigarettes, yeah. <laughs> Slide 60. <laughs> what is this? 
well, this is just, uh, uh, you know, don't try to read any of it. It's just some of the categories that you'll find when you go searching for categories from, this is from the Wall Street Journal, but Lipper has their own and Moneystar has their own. There are dozens of categories, folks. We have just learned the most um, co- important ones, the, the, uh, the, the categories. There are subcategories and then sub, sub, subcategories. So that's what you're up against. But realize that many of them are just variations on a theme, on the themes that we've looked at in this presentation. And then every once in a while, you'll find mutual funds that really don't fit any category and some of them tend to be the ones that sort of start a whole new category. If somebody does something new and, oh, my goodness, they create a whole new category for it. So it's, 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 it, that's the cool thing, in my humble opinion, about the investment world. You will never learn everything about this industry. It's just impossible. No one person can do it all. You can't. And if anybody says you, you, they can, you just smile and realize they're fooling themselves because it's immense. It's, it's, it's too huge for one person to get their, um, get, become thoroughly immersed in. But the more you learn, the, the more I find it's, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. It's filled with um, very, very um, folks with lots of integrity and folks with not a whole lot of integrity and then everybody in, in between. Finally, oh my goodness, how long have I been? I apologize. Uh, one last slide before we take a break. And that's, the, uh, the, the types of the mutual funds as created by Morningstar. Now, this is their old value bo- or style box. They called it the style box. The style of the mutual fund and the size. And, and this style box was also uh, guilty <laughs> of helping to create a whole new, whole new mutual funds because all of a sudden investors thought they needed a mutual fund for each individual box and so the companies designed a mutual fund for each individual box uh, they decide that they're not that good, any, good anymore and they now have ownership zones because you want to think outside the box <laughs> and I don't know anybody uses these things I don't use them I, I again I'm more for broad diversification but uh, check them out on, mute, on Morningstar when you do your research Cool? Okay, so thank you for sticking with us. Go back over, study these guys, study that scramble sheet, make sure you know the major categories. You are going to be awesome. You are going to be the investment gurus. I keep telling you that, but I'm serious. You're going to speak with authority, and we are proud of you. Now, in our next and final presentation on mutual funds, we'll take a look at mutual fund families and then zero in on just a single mutual fund as a proxy, as a substitute, as a, as a guide for mutual funds in general. And then see how well, what's in it for me? See how well these things can do for us over the long term. Okay, so we'll see you in our next and final presentation, dear students, when we take a look at mutual fund families and a simple sing- single mutual fund, sample mutual fund. See ya.